Stephen Williams is a writer, director, and producer born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica. He schooled in UK and after university moved to Toronto, where he started his career in the screen industry. His first feature film, Soul Survivor, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival to critical acclaim. He went on to direct several episodics and films, and in fact, he won numerous awards, including a Gemini for Best Director for Hard Time, The David Milgard Story. He has directed and produced the iconic series Lost, and he has directed many other U.S. shows, including The Americans, The Walking Dead, Ray Donovan, and Westworld. In 2019, he signed on as executive producer and director for HBO's Watchmen, which he was nominated for directorial achievement by the Directors Guild of America and won an Emmy for producing the series. And it is my pleasure to welcome Stephen Williams. What I loved in your bio is that you are born in Jamaica and clearly by your hat, you are truly Jamaican and you you'd like to promote that, which I yeah, love. Man. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, for sure. And you went to England when you were 13 from Jamaica. Yeah. yeah. And is it like because your family moved there? No, I went to uh, England on uh, a scholarship to, I, I went to boarding school in England. My parents stayed behind in Jamaica and, uh, so I went to high school in England from from the time I was 13 until, you know, did my A-levels, graduated in eight, at age 18. Then I went to university in Bristol, also in England. And um, I had had enough of England at that point. I had some sense of what I wanted to do with my the rest of my life career wise. And wait, wait, what, well, was the sense, what was the sense you had? Like you know, I had been from a very early age, I had been completely obsessed with movies. Like I would, I was that kid that would cut classes in Kingston, Jamaica. When I went to, where I went to school was surrounded by cinemas. And I would, I got very adept at putting my name down on the register so that I, uh, everyone would think that I was at school. And then I would slip out, duck under the fence and go and watch movies. And uh, somehow I was able to get good enough grades while spending very very little time in in uh, in class but i was just obsessed with movies and i would consume them indiscriminately um sometimes triple bills you know come out at the end of seeing three movies back to back into blazing hot jamaican sun my pupils <laughs> dilating to try and adjust to the the light differential and um so i was had been obsessed with movies from a very early age and storytelling books movies um all kinds of stories and by the time i got out of university or got got out of high school and started university, I had a sense that not only was I obsessed with these cultural artifacts known as movies, but that there were people behind the scenes who were making these movies and shaping them and and that those people were called directors and I wanted to be a director. And but I had it on good authority that you had to go to America to make that happen. But so what was my, you didn't sorry, study ahead. that though. I was just gonna say I'm sorry to stop you, but you didn't study that in university, even though no. this is what you knew you wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, look, when I went to school, the notion both in terms of my family, culturally, coming from Jamaica, there were basically like three professions, you know. I mean, you were doctor, lawyer, teacher, right? Those were the only legit things to do with your life. The idea that you would have ever uttered out loud that you wanted to have a career in film or wanted to be a director would have been um, an occasion for scorn and 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 ridicule and derision. And so I didn't know that there was a path. I only knew that I had this uh, undying affection and obsession for visual storytelling um so i ended up getting a degree in english and philosophy <clears throat> because i you know um loved literature as well and uh but yeah i mean i i had a sense that it was all happening in america and so it was my initial intention to leave england and somehow find my way to america but you know then as now i think it's harder to get into america than it is to get into canada and so um, I was, I, I shifted, shifted course and, um, came to, came to found myself in Toronto. Now, when you got to Toronto, did you know anyone? Nobody. I knew no one in Toronto. So um, and I wound up in public housing at, uh, Victoria Park and Danforth and got a job very quickly as a production assistant at a commercial house. 
uh, commercial production house. Um, and that was one of the great opportunities actually in my life um, because I was able to have a front row seat to filmmaking um, and to the construction of commercials. And I learned all kinds of things from about every aspect of, of the craft actually. So what I never understood, I know like you contacted me and you came over to my to my home, but how did that happen? I'm trying to remember, how did the contact happen? That is, um, well, first of all, I apologize. <laughs> um, I don't remember that, which is convenient. Uh, <laughs> uh, beautiful because somehow we, you reached out and you were like, I'm new in Canada. I don't know people here. Can you, can we meet? And yeah. I know we sat and had a great conversation and this is in such the early days. I think you had just landed in Canada. Well, that probably happened because, um, as as I'm happy to report to whoever is going to be, you know, witness to this uh, encounter. When I first got to Toronto, you were the most successful black person, like in the field of culture. Like everybody knew your name. You were the entire community was proud of you. Uh, uh, as as I was, you had somehow uh in the early days managed to storm the barriers of uh equal access by probably by a combination of determination and talent and as well as just a kind of gracious disposition which you clearly maintain to this day and you were everybody was like well if you want to get into that line of work you gotta like somehow connect to tanya williams because she is the only person who has somehow managed to make that happen and carve out this illustrious and respected career and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's that was my motivation um you know what's so beautiful for me to even hear that is that you have so superseded any place i was and that you are that person now that people just look to are and in awe of the career trajectory you've had and where you are, your position in Hollywood today. And we're gonna get to, to all of that because I am just so proud of this. I came into, I'm just so proud of you. And your dog is getting in on this, so I love it. <laughs> and Sorry, they, and they should. <laughs> so, okay, so now you're doing, you've gotten into some commercials that you're doing in Toronto. Are you still thinking at some point I need to get to the States? Is that kind of prevalent in your mind? Or were you thinking, this is a good gig here. I could stay in Canada and have a good career. Um, I'm not thinking about going to the States at that point. I'm not thinking about anything other than unraveling the puzzle known as filmmaking. Like how what what is lighting what is a what is an f stop which is what they were called then now they're called t stops um but what is a what does a lens do what is um what is the difference between high speed film and uh daylight balanced film and tungsten balanced film and um you know what is a master shot and uh what does a gaffer do what does a grip do it was all on that level trying to figure all of that out all of that was fascinating and exotic and, and interesting to me. And so um, I wasn't really thinking long term. I wasn't I didn't really have a kind of career plan. I just was following my nose and and trying to deconstruct and understand the nuts and bolts of how to use images to tell a story. And how long in that process were you when you decided I'm going to make my own film? I. I, I tell you what's really, I'm glad you asked that question because it gives me an opportunity to say something that I think is uh, honest, um, not necessarily helpful, but it's truthful. And that has to do with luck, right? So the company that I got hired by was not the company I initially set out to um to try and gain access to. Uh, and I, there was a company, I think that probably still exists in Toronto, it was called Partners, and they were the largest commercial production house in Toronto at the time. And I was like, okay, that's the biggest and the best, I gotta get there. But they had like 50 PAs on staff. 
And they were like, yeah, we could get you some daily work, but you know, can't take you on. And so eventually I got hired at a much smaller boutique company called Scholar Productions, which was on Bedford Road. And mm -hmm. there were only two PAs. And so I was one of those. And the, the lucky thing about that, which would not have happened at Partners, was that I was able to pester the dude who owned the company and who was their leading director, because there were only two of us. And so I would, on the weekends, uh, take their cameras out, take their short ends, which are leftover remnants of uh, film stock that had been used on previous shows that they had stored in the basement. And I would write these little fake commercials and shoot them and edit them on the moviola that they had in the basement of, of the production company. And because I had been lucky enough to get hired at this much smaller production house, the guy whose name was Ed Zemla, I remember it to this day, he was... Uh, he was willing to hear me out and I would knock on his office door and go, Hey man, I, I shot this uh, thing. Uh, would you take a look at it and give me some pointers? And he would, he would look at my fake commercials and kind of go, yeah, this works and that doesn't work. You might want to try this next time. And I would repeat that process every couple of weeks. And so very shortly I started, um, you know, understanding how to at least just the basics of the thing. And, right. you know, fortuitously, one day I <clears throat> walked into his office with like after six months and had this a reel, like a few of these commercials. And he said, look, a, a pool of PSAs have just come in the door, public service announcements, and none of the resident directors want to do them. They just want to do beer spots and car spots where all the money is. These PSAs, there's no money. And why don't you take a crack at them? And so i did and uh there were six a pool of six 15 second spots and they turned out really well and i got hired like literally on a friday i was a pa pushing a broom at that company and on mm -hmm. monday i was a director at that company doing commercials um so that's really how it happened so i just think it's really important for people you know you that whole old adage that i'm gonna mess up so i i will just refer to it but not try to replicate it of being prepared uh but waiting biding your time until fortune and fate look your way with a smile but being prepared so that when that happens you can move decisively that's really important you know you're you're incredibly humble and I think you're not even aware that you're incredibly humble because within your story, there's some pieces that I'm hearing. One, you're pushing a broom and some people, they don't wanna do that. And that's what you need to do to move ahead. Two, you were offered something that you were even told no one else wants to do. Right. And you grabbed right. that. <laughs> right. That's but I love true. How you that's see funny. It. I never thought of it like that, but yeah, I, I was so excited. Like, I just got all this great opportunity, but it's because you said yes. And there are a lot of people that would have, the people that said no, could be sitting where you're sitting today had they said yes from that. That's funny. But you, oh, that. Yes, you grabbed the opportunity. You're incredibly talented as well. I think the fact that on your own initiative, you started just making those commercials. No one was paying. You were doing whatever you could to move. So don't even sell that short. That is 90% more than a lot of people I hear who are breaking into the industry who just keep saying, no one's giving me an opportunity. You made those right. opportunities happen. Right. So those PSAs got you hired on. So now you're a busy guy doing commercials. Yeah. More than likely. Yeah. Yeah. So I was doing commercials, but I, you know, uh, but I wanted, I've always wanted to do personal work. I've always wanted to do work that, again, you've given me the opportunity to talk about something that I think is, you know, relevant, which is this industry and probably like many other industries, uh, um, is a challenging one. It's difficult, it's highly competitive, it's subject to the vagaries of fashion, uh, who or what flavor is in fashion at any particular moment in time beyond your control. And the only thing that's gonna sustain you in this environment is if you have a love, uh, almost, uh, I've used this word before, almost an obsession that you cannot deny uh, it just keeps knocking at your spiritual door, at your emotional core. And so for me, it was, um, I just loved it. 
and uh, loved trying to figure out how to put images together in a way that would create an emotional response in someone who's, who observed those images in juxtaposition to each other and in a way allowed us to have an empathetic conversation with each other. How, how could my soul communicate with another person's soul? Because that's what movie going had been for me. I would sit in a darkened theater and be astonished at the magic trick of how movies made by people in different countries with, with you know, different demographics, somehow it was as if they were pickpocketing my own experience and they knew what I was feeling. Uh, that experience is intoxicating to me and still is. And it's the thing I chase with everything that I, that I take on, you know? So I, lo I, I, I love the, you're giving such a great little kernel of knowledge to people in this industry. Um, through all that, when did you decide, how did you write Soul Survivor? So while you were doing the commercials, you had this idea and then you started crafting the script for, you were like, I'm gonna throw it all in and make a feature. Well, there's one, no, I think I think what happened was, I mean, yeah, that's, man, we're going back a minute. So uh, yeah, I started writing um, what became Soul Survivor. At one point it was called Cherio, Cherio Baby after the Jamaican song. <clears throat> And um, my mother, it was an homage to my mother in some senses, because my mother's nickname, my mother's name is Ivy, but for reasons that I don't really remember, she her nickname throughout her childhood and young adulthood was Cherry. And uh, it's a character in the movie that um, is based on on my mother and, and my grandmother. And, uh, but I wrote the script because it was about, it was, it was based on my experiences as a Jamaican immigrant in, Tomor in Toronto. And I would watch movies like uh, Mean Streets, Scorsese's Mean Streets, which were about Italian Americans in New York. And, and I found those, that, that movie and movies of that kind really affecting and wondered, well, why couldn't we just do something like that with Jamaicans? Like there's nothing different about Jamaicans than anybody else. Um, so other than, you know, how special and uniquely brilliant um, the collectivity <laughs> of Jamaicans are, but that's a that's a separate conversation. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to I wanted to try and fashion a movie and speak to a world and an environment that was uh, rooted in my Jamaicanness and my experience as a Jamaican immigrant in a way that was hopefully universal. And so I started to write that piece because it was personal, uh, and then something was happening in the culture at large i think probably triggered by you know the work that spike lee and and um the hughes brothers and and uh maddie rich and people of that ilk in one of the 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 the, the waves of black cinema that uh periodically or you know uh emerge in america before um other harsher realities uh impact them um and i think that in Canada, we were feeling the reverberations of, um, you know, a spike led voice. And so the Canadian Film Centre, which existed at that time, but had not done a particularly good job of, up until that moment of being uh, inclusive or diverse, um, decided that they were going to have a, a, a sort of small limited program. I believe it was called the Summer Lab that was devoted exclusively to or predominantly to um, you know, uh, inclusivity. Right. And I think my script got read by someone there. And so I got invited to participate in that program. It was a very short program, like, you know, two or three months. I can't remember, um, but it was short. And uh, I workshopped the script there and, um, you know, um, met other people who ultimately became part of the making of that movie. But, uh, yeah, that's how it, it, it was an out, out, the short answer is it was an outcrop of, or an outgrowth of me trying to find a way to uh, have my voice, intrude my voice into the, in, into my cinematic endeavors, as opposed to doing commercials, which were uh, while fun and still gave me the opportunity to sharpen my craft and hone my craft, really didn't have anything to do with me, you know? Yeah. 
What year was that about approximately when you went with the CFC lab that you did? Man, I am so chronologically impaired, but I want to <laughs> say it was in the 90s. Okay. Yeah. And okay, so this is the incredible part for me. You do this movie, it gets invited to the Cannes Film Festival. Like, right. what are you feeling when you hear that? I mean, I can't even imagine. Um, it was a big, I mean, for me, Cannes remains, weirdly enough. I mean, there are a lot of other festivals. Toronto Film Festival is huge. Um, obviously, Sundance and South by Southwest now. And, you know, the world has expanded a lot since then. But there is something special about the Cannes Film Festival um, and the relationship of the French to cinema. And um, so that was the thing. That was the real kind of, um, you know, uh, validation, if you will, external validation. So, yeah, I mean, Soul Survivor got invited to open uh, a, a, a kind of um, portion of the festival called Critics Week. There were only seven films then. I don't know how many now, but there were only seven films that were selected from worldwide to participate in that, um, in that portion of the festival. And, and Soul Survivor got invited. So it was, it was huge um, for me. Uh, but look, I was also somewhat embarrassed about the movie because, you know, <clears throat> I hadn't done a lot before then. I'd done commercials. I'd made one short film that had played the Toronto Film Festival the year before. And then I made this movie and I was really just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And uh, I consider myself to be self-taught, which is not a bad thing. I think that there are pluses and minuses about studying film at, at a lot of institutions. and. At the end of the day, I think that there is no substitute for watching movies and deconstructing them for yourself and then trying to figure out actually how to make them. The actual making of the of, of things is where you learn the most. Um, but, you know, I hadn't made a lot of stuff before then, so I had a lot more to learn. <laughs> um, but you must have met a lot of people and built relationships, probably relationships that you later on were able to connect with in Los Angeles, do you think? Or did you do you feel like you were more isolated at can? Like, did you really work the moment? Um, not really. I did not work the moment. Um, I was a deer in the headlights <laughs> and I. Uh, you know, I, I, it doesn't come naturally to me, to be honest, to work the moment is just not something I am particularly proficient at. It's a tool that a lot of people have in our industry and are able to use um, and deploy very well. I, I'm not, I don't particularly relish it and I don't have much of an appetite for it. And I'm consequently, I'm not very good at it. So I didn't really do that. Um, but I did get inquiries from agents in America that I kind of put on ice for a minute. Um, you know, I had a family in, in, uh, in, in Toronto. I mean, they, they come with me wherever I go. Um, but, uh, I had just started a family and, uh, and my family and, you know, um, is really, really important to me. And, uh, it's really important for me to figure out some kind of equilibrium around my work and my, and my, and my family. And so I wasn't, kind of I didn't really work the moment to be to be honest I but yes contacts were made which later came into play for sure to me that's just working the moment even if you walk away sometimes with two contacts you'd be amazed how just later on I always say that it's not the volume of contacts that you get but just two great people that you can um, rely on but you come back from con did you start did you have an agent in Toronto by the way I did. Yeah, I did have an agent in Toronto. Yeah. And were you able then to leverage? Did you move from commercials? Were you, did that movie help you start doing because you started doing some drama? Like, actual yes. Shows. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that the movie helped a lot. Uh, in fact, I am pretty sure that while I was promoting the movie, in fact, I was in Italy at another film festival and I had been hired by Linda Schuyler to do a show that was not Degrassi, but was one of her other shows. Right. And um, and I'm to this day indebted to her for 
having taken, having rolled the dice on me. Um, uh, because that started one thing, you know, one thing led to another. If you, in, in, in our industry, as you well know, you get these opportunities, <clears throat> a lot's riding on them. And if you pull it off, then other doors open and you just keep walking through those doors and, um, and, and hope that, you know, that process continues. So yeah, I started doing episodic in Toronto, um, uh, and learning lots by doing it, you know, and, and winning some significant awards. <laughs> some Gemini. Yeah, we did, uh, I mean, I did an MOW, uh, based on David Milgard's story, um, which ended up winning, I believe they were called, I, I think, I think the, the awards have merged now, but in those yeah, days, yeah, Canadian screen awards now, but at the time the, these were the Gemini's. I exactly. Believe. Exactly. That's exactly right. And so that movie won, uh, I won like lots of us that were involved with that movie won, And I was actually proud of that movie that felt like, um, it felt personal. It felt like I was able to, um, start feeling a sense of my own voice and how I could um, make specific to me the the way in which that that story was told. Um, so that was a really gratifying experience, actually. And the and the Milgard family, David Milgard's mother, was present almost every day on set, and that she felt that the movie uh, somehow held a reasonable light um held her family up and her family's experience and david's experience specifically in a, up in a reasonable light was really important to me and it was gratifying it's a it's a fantastic film um now lost came pretty soon after that didn't it and were, yeah were you hired as a canadian director had you moved to the states or were they shooting up in canada and they no then we never shot in canada we shot in the entire series of lost we shot everything in Hawaii ex except for two days, which we shot in London. Uh, but um, that's one of those here, here again, luck, right? I mean, I just feel like I've been so fortunate and blessed. So I'm doing episodic in Toronto. I do Milgard. It wins all these awards. I get some, I reactivate some of those business contacts that I'd made in Cannes around agents who had expressed interest at that time in me coming to explore the possibility of working in America that I had um, ignored in deference to my life in Toronto at the time. And after Milgard did what it did, I was kind of like, okay, so now what do I do? I'm here in Canada and I've won what was at the time the top award for uh, TV. What am I going to do? Do that again? Or do I stretch more? Do I grow more? And also an appetite for growth and to push yourself further is, you know, I think an important part of our endeavor. And so I was like, okay, there's a different game in America. <clears throat> Everybody word on the street is, you know, that's the apex, you know, America's the apex predator in this game. So I was interested to see how I would fare there. And I came to, I started commuting between Toronto and LA to do episodic. And one of the shows that I did was a show, curiously enough, that starred a Canadian, Jill Hennessy, and it was called Crossing Jordan. And uh, I did that show um, for a couple of seasons. And one of the junior writers on that show was a guy called Damon Lindelof. And I ended up doing a lot of his episodes and we became casually friendly. I come back to Toronto and I get a call from my agent saying, Hey, Damon's on this pilot of this show with a dude called JJ. And I remember saying to my, uh, my wife, um, you know, this is the thing about America. Like what kind of a grown up calls himself JJ really? Like, who is this guy? No idea who this, these people were. I knew Damon, but I didn't know any idea about JJ. I was like, okay, send me the pilot. I'll have a look at it. And I got busy doing something else and didn't watch the pilot of this show about these, these survivors of a plane crash on an island for like two weeks. And my agent called and was like, you really need to just watch this thing and either say yes or no, you're interested. 
And I went, okay, sorry, my bad. I apologize. Uh, I watched the pilot and I was like baffled. I was like, I could have sworn my agent said this was a TV show, but it looks like a movie. It feels like a movie and it's unbelievable. I can't believe they're making this for TV. Uh, so I spoke to JJ and Damon and they were like, look, we want you to come and be a part of the show. And I was like, yeah, I don't know the Hawaii thing. It's so far from Toronto, <clears throat> but um, okay, I'll come and do an episode and see, you know, how it feels. Go to Hawaii, haven't even left the airport yet in Honolulu when boom, hit by tropical humid air, reminds me of Jamaica, flashback to Jamaica immediately. And I go, hmm, I might like it here. You know, the scripts were great, the cast was great. One of the things that people don't remember is when we started that show, it was off season. It was, we did 13 episodes before the show ever got seen or picked up. And so the first 13 episodes that we did, we had no idea whether anybody was going to like that show or not. We only knew that we loved the, the scripts and um, the story and the cast. And we were just having that kind of, uh, you know, um, this kind of kind of cloistered experience, just us. Uh, we all lived on the island and we worked on the island and it was a very rare convergence of things um, that happened as a result of just this random uh, booking on Crossing Jordan and me crossing paths with Damon. And um, so I came back to Toronto and lost dropped and blew up immediately. And JJ and Damon were like, would you consider coming to Hawaii and being a permanent part of the show and moving your family there and being uh, a producer as well as a director, producing director. And after consultation, which didn't take long because it was probably in the winter in Toronto, <laughs> everybody in the family was like, yeah, let's bounce. Let's go to, let's go to the 808. Let's go to Hawaii. And so, uh, we went in 2005 and lived and worked in Hawaii until 2010 when the show was over. You know, you're confirming something that I sometimes, I, I, often I tell people who are starting in this industry. They start thinking about moving to L.A. or getting out of Canada way too early. And I think what's mm -hmm. important in your story is you're at the top of your game in Toronto. You have created this career in Canada, you could have uh, stayed. I think it's, I think you need to wait always until you are literally at the top of your game, wherever you are, before you even start considering stretching beyond that, as opposed to leaving a country because you think, oh, I can <coughs> work here. I'm getting no opportunities here. I don't think it gets easier going somewhere else. Right. Stay where you are. I totally agree. And look, because as I understand it, the object of this exercise you and i discoursing together is to try to be helpful to people who may be watching this and uh can potentially glean something of use so um i would say i would add to what you said the following the what i've tried to do i haven't been able to do it with a degree of perfection but what i've tried to do as consistently as possible is only do is is let the material and the auspices let the material and the people who are part of that process guide my decision making so it's not a volume business it's not about don't just take every gig because you've been offered a gig as best you can sometimes you have to right for money or experience or whatever or you just want to work um you just want to be back on a set but you will grow more as a filmmaker and your opportunities will be exponentially greater if you attach yourself to strong material that you have a personal connection to. Um, and so that's what I've used as my rubric in decision making. Uh, as I say, there have been moments where I, for whatever reason, pay, had to pay the bills, had to, you know, just wanted to work, wanted to exercise that those those skills that those muscles um i've taken gigs but as best as i possibly can i try to only do things that are 
in keeping with my own kind of worldview and my own uh, compass direction. And I have found that 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 path is both intrinsically more satisfying and also from a strategic point of view is pays the greater dividends. Now, I'm curious because, as you say, when you were in Hawaii, you were getting this producing opportunity. You had not done producing before. Speak a little about what it was like to look at the work conceptually as a director and then now also look at it in terms of a producer. Uh, that's an interesting question. So when I first got offered the opportunity to both to, to be a producing director on the show, I had no idea what that meant. Uh, and I asked someone who had done that job and they gave me a great thumbnail description of how to think about it, how to conceptualize it. And that was, you're directing the episodes that you're directing. So in terms of Lost, I would direct every third episode, right? Uh, in a season. Um, but then it was my responsibility to oversee the other directors who were doing other episodes that I wasn't directing. And this person said to me, just approach all those episodes that you're producing but not directing in terms of prep and in terms of their execution. Just imagine that you are directing them, only you're not. Um, and so you try to help that filmmaker who has been assigned to a specific episode have all the things in play that you would want to have in play in order to uh, ensure the success of that episode and the telling of that particular narrative beat in the overall arc of the story. And so that allowed me to kind of, okay, that's a bite-sized way of imagining what this task can be. And it it's about making the best possible episode. And so that made sense to me. And so I kind of learned uh, more about that aspect of the job by, by doing it, obviously. But coming into it, that was the conception that I had. And then on a macro level, subsequent to that, I now try, with very few exceptions, to only do things that I'm also concurrently producing because it just gives you the greatest degree of authorial voice in the execution of the piece. Um, and so, which is ultimately what you're trying to do. You're trying to protect a, as best as you can, uh, a singular vision about the way in which, a, a particular point of view about the way in which a story gets told. There must have been a lot of, um... Um, just, I'm thinking of experience going back and forth. You're, if you're working on something iconic like Lost, you're meeting directors you probably haven't worked with before. <clears throat> Are you also looking and watching and learning their process and their, um, just how they lay it all out, how they execute the, in the way they do, they do? And did you draw from that and take from that? That's a great question. Um, you know, as a general rule, directors don't get to observe what other directors, how other directors um, tackle the task at hand. Uh, having said that, I don't know that Lost was such a great example of that because the show was huge. It was so busy. I was spread so thinly. Those years blend one into the other in a an endless schmear of effort and exhaustion. Um, I, and to be honest, at that point in my career, I was increasingly looking to feature directors and to movie directors as, and trying to understand how to be on that level uh, as opposed to TV. So um, I'm sure that had I been uh, focused on that, that would have been a great opportunity to learn from, from the other <laughs> directors, but I, 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 I didn't, I wasn't in that headspace at that time. Now I, I'm trying to imagine leaving an iconic show like Lost at that point, you and your family must've decided let's make them, let's settle in Los Angeles. Hmm. And now are you <clears throat> getting inundated with projects that you're trying to weed through and find that 
thing that can ignite that feeling that you had at lost? Or are you trying to mourn loss and feel a new direction of where you want to go in your career? Kind of both, kind of both. That's um, kind of both. Uh, the first part of it is, so, you know, our kids had now gone to school and lived in Hawaii for five, six years. Our youngest child, our daughter was born in Hawaii and we loved Hawaii. Like when, you know, we would shoot 22, 23 episodes and have like two months off before we started the next season and everybody else would decamp and, you know, go all over the place. And, you know, we would stay in Hawaii. We would do one trip a year after the season was over somewhere, wherever the kids wanted to go, we'd go. And then we'd come back to Hawaii because it really, you know, this is going to turn into a, a the tourist the Hawaii tourist board's greatest dream. But like Hawaii is like an amazing, amazing place culturally and and geographically. So we actually didn't want to leave Hawaii. We explored the possibility of could the kids stay and go to school? Our two eldest, our our twin boys. Um, actually had just gotten into Punahou, which is the same school that Barack Obama went to, and it was a great school. And and uh, but after much deliberation, we realized that we would, you know, have to. We would. It would be best for our family to be intact if we all moved to LA. The the converse to that would have been the family stays in Hawaii, the kids go to school there, and I'm on a plane constantly back and forth for meetings and to shoot and whatever. So we decided that we would move to to LA and um, continue the adventure. But the other part of your question as it pertains to work is I have had that experience on, I've been fortunate enough to have that experience a couple of times, a few times in my career. You do something that's really successful in the sense of the way in which it's received by the world, by the viewing public and creatively. And it is natural after that to go, okay, the bar has been set. I don't want to do anything that's less than that. I just want to ladder up from there. I just want to keep going in that direction. But it is the law of averages that those projects that like hit that sweet spot, that bullseye are few and far between. And so you do grieve the loss of that experience and you do, it does, make problematic your your deliberation and your assessment process of everything that is being offered to you and sometimes you can you know after Milgard, i didn't do anything for a long time because i just kept reading things going well this isn't Milgard, so like i can't do that this is just going to be a downer after that and at a certain point and that's one of those occasions actually after i had turned everything down after Milgard you know, a bunch of months had gone by and the bills had piled up and I ended up having to take a gig for money. So, you know, it's, there's no roadmap in our industry. It's the, it's the wild west and you kind of have to follow your nose and figure it out and follow your, your heart and your spirit. And, uh, so yeah, the, the, the end of lost was a mixed bag. It was, um, but yeah, it was a new beginning also at the same time. This is a great opportunity now to talk about the relationship you have with your agents, with the business people that you're surrounded by. Those, how do you, how do you have that relationship where they really understand you and what your needs and wants are, and how you move together as a team? Yeah, um, I think that it's a really it's a really important decision you know who your team is who your inner circle is and they have to understand you and get your uh get your own take on your your own point of view about your own personal trajectory in the business because there are those agents who just want to book you they go the guy's hot he's coming off a hot show let's just book him on everything and that doesn't necessarily line up with what the path you see for yourself <clears throat> so frustration can arise if you don't if you're not on the same page so the first thing is is the is the person competent b do they get you and see what is the measure of their character like 
there's professional competence and then there's character and you can have one without the other on both sides of that equation and the sweet spot is to have both and it takes um you know given that we are all works in progress we're learning about ourselves and we're learning about our representation we're learning about what we want from our representation in an ongoing way and so um those are the criteria but it's it's a shifting it's a world of shifting sands there are very few people i know that actually have the same agent now that they had 10 years ago or the same team uh i think the people that do are blessed i have had people in my corner for a very long time but i've also had the experience of going of finding myself at a crossroads around those decisions and going i need to make a change that's good for me and you know you try to do it as respectfully as you possibly can because it's like a breakup of any kind you know um it's tough uh and people's feelings get hurt and people feel rejected but um i think if you you know if you just try to be again it's what i said about character and, and your values if you try to move through the world in a way that is fair uh as as best as you see it um that's that's a good kind of guide you know I don't know if I answered that question no no you really. did very eloquently actually <laughs> you did that very well now before I get to the next iconic show of Watchman, <laughs> because before I get that you were on a number of great shows I'm talking person of interest the Americans the Walking Dead Ray Donovan, Westworld, you're like the menu of everyone's dream list. So is that you working with your team? Are you saying these are shows I really want to go on? Are these shows just coming to you and then you're going, oh yeah, you know, that is a, a good show. Do you, did you strategically go, these are shows I really want to do work on? No, I, some of those shows were people that I'd worked with before. So, you know, I did Lost with you know, Bad Robot and J.J. Abrams and uh, got to, you know, we became, you know, friends and collaborators. And so I did another show with him called The Undercovers uh, right after uh, Lost. And then um, Person of Interest is a J.J. show and um, Westworld's a J.J. show. So again, I feel like if you are, if you can find, it's again, that combination of material and the people who are, um who are you know attached to that material uh it's both of those things and so uh so that took care of those shows and then the other thing was just literally you know i got offered a bunch of things and you just kind of sift through them and try and find like i said earlier the risk of being repetitious you try to find material that speaks to you at a particular moment in time and that you think you can bring something to uh, because of what's agitated inside you and needs to be worked on and navigated and resolved maybe through the process of working on that material. So it really is about that um, more, than, was, more than seeking things out, to be honest. I was going to say, though, I'm not sure you're aware, but you have such a great reputation that people want to work with you. Like you come to set, there's no, there's the drama's not there. You are a work person. You know, you just want to come in, you're prepared. I don't think you can devalue that. I think that's what word gets around. I mean, Hollywood, I live here too. Word gets around about people and you're not just getting offered these things. You know, yes, you're a brilliant director, but you and I both know they're brilliant directors who people don't want to work with because it's just right. it's not right. worth the headache. And you can even tell in this conversation, you're a fairly easygoing guy. Who right. I can see people just gravitating towards your personality, like you're likable, but you're likable and you just you're prepared, but you can tell you like to be prepared. Yeah, I mean, I do. And I and I, you know, I'm kind of boring, right? I am just about the work and I'm about my family. So I don't people are always mystified. They're kind of like, do you go to these functions? And, you know, I mean, I'll be completely honest and as nauseating as it's going to sound, it, it's true. And, but I'll just tell you, and I don't actually advise this. So this is not prescriptive. It just happens to follow from what you just said. I've been fortunate enough to be nominated for Emmys and go to the Emmys and those kinds of events. I hate them. 
if if my wife didn't say this is a great opportunity for me to dress up that's why we should go i wouldn't go to any of those things i don't care about those things they don't connect to me i don't relate to them uh, you know i i don't mean to be disingenuous it's always great for for t- to be nominated or to have people kind of go hey you're you did well your work you know that validation obviously it feels good it's better than the converse it's better than dude you suck but at the same time i'm not invested in those things i'm i really uh i just love the work and what it you know for me it's kind of like it's it's an opportunity to express myself artistically and to learn something about myself and to learn something about my relationship to the world and the the endeavor known as uh life right so once that's done the other stuff is of no interest really to me i just want to i just like go to work and then i want to come home and hang out with my family as i've said because my family is the most entertaining group of people i know <clears throat> so um <laughs> i could uh <laughs> You know, I mean, it's a great thing when your kids are old enough uh, to tease you and to, you know, uh, force you to laugh at yourself. These are these are great, great gifts. That's where real wealth is to be found, not in some other places. So um, anyway, we're drifting off into esoteric. No, no, no. But I was going to say that that plays into you are just being your authentic self. There's some people that are more extroverted and need that. And. Um, as weird as it sounds, I am an introvert in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that you're an introvert, but I've created a personality that can be extroverted, but it's not in my true nature. And I think that's what you're speaking to that you have to do. I've met, um, people who just are w- at such ease moving through those, um, events. And I, yeah. just, I find it. I'm so drained. Sometimes I need a whole week to recover. So true. One. But just... you're right. I, I know people like that too. And, uh, you know, you know, my brother, my brother's one of those people. He just lives for that stuff. And I just go, wow, that's amazing. I wish I had that skill, but I just don't, I, I really don't have that gene. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about walking dead because it's a, an example of something I said before. So walking dead, I got off of that show. Didn't want to do just a regular episode. And then a supersized episode came along that was very unique and special. It was a two-hander, basically, uh, and it was an origin story of a character. And it was like, you know, an hour and a half. And I thought, ah, I this character's journey connects to me. And there's a way in which I can shoot this that feels like, or I can explore shooting it that feels like it both stretches me and feels comfortable to me at the same time. Did that episode got was very well received and then obviously in the natural order of things they were like like great we would you come and do a lot more episodes and i again was like again using that same set of criteria i was like well i don't know how a regular episode is going to be any more uh thrilling or satisfying an experience than the one that i just did so no and I've never done, I've done one, only one. And uh, because of that reason, and, and, and that episode I think was special enough that it in turn opened, continued that kind of uh, relay race of opening one door after another, after another. And in a way that had I ended up doing maybe six or eight episodes of which let's say a good portion of them were merely average, the from a strategic point of view as well as from a creative point of view it would not have been it would have been an increase in volume but not an increase in quality it would have been an increase in quantity but not an increase in quality and so i just think it's i I just wanted to double back and reiterate that it's my own personal approach i don't know how useful it is for anybody else but it is how I approach things. Um, I think it's a good way to approach things. So tell us now what the what was the episode and what is the character that you felt this way? I'm I was so afraid you're going to ask me because <laughs> I've forgotten his name. Oh God, it was Lenny. Oh. It was um, he's an English actor. He was uh, black character. Uh, oh yeah, we I know the one you mean, and I can't remember his name either, which is terrible. But. The, but the main black character, but what was he sort of going through his arc of what he was going through? Yeah, it was right after his family had been killed and he'd been wandering around in the, the, the wilderness with a staff 
very biblical staff uh, surviving. And he encounters this guy played by uh, John Connor, I want to say, but that's probably wrong too. But an amazing actor out of New York, actually. And they end up being sequestered in this remote location. And um, he gets taught, Lenny's character gets taught uh, in a kind of karate kid kind of way um, about how to channel his grief and anger into a more spiritually productive way by virtue of his relationship and association with this other character that he encounters. And um, uh, so there was just something about that episode that was self-contained. It didn't feel like uh, it could fit into the body of, uh, it didn't feel generic in the way that often episodes of a TV series can can feel. It was a standalone one-off thing. Uh, and that was that made it special and different and unique. Oh, that's beautiful. I do remember the episode actually now that you go, go through that part of it. And, and they they would have some of those episodes where they really focused on one character a lot to give you the whole backstory almost of where they are today. Yeah. Um, I would be remiss if we were to go and I don't hear about how did Watchmen come to be because <clears throat> I mean to have these experiences that you've had these are iconic um, shows that are are coming into your sphere and this is another phenomenal one. Watchmen is part of came out of my relationship with Damon. So I guess you're right. You, t you asked early on about these relationships and uh, protecting these relationships, valuing these relationships. So, I mean, Damon and I have worked together since 2004. So actually, and not true, since 2002. <laughs> and uh, I, there is something about the way in which he writes. I think he's a singular voice. I don't think anybody else writes like him. I think he is brave and courageous in a way that very few other writers uh, that I've had the, that have been fortunate enough to work with um, uh, are. And uh, and he called and said, you know, I'm doing this this show, and I want you to be a part of it. And I said no about 300 times because of the subject matter. I was like, it was it was twofold. Partly it was going to shoot. We shot in Wales uh, and in Atlanta. So that meant time away from my family. So that's always, again, like if time away from my family is part of the equation, though, the, the work needs to really earn that. Otherwise, I don't want to do it. I could bore you as indelicate a subject to discuss as it is with the thousand things that I've been offered that have not met that criteria. They... You know, they for other people, they may have been great opportunities, but for me, they didn't earn their keep in terms of time away from my family. Uh, and so this one was, you know, Atlanta, Wales is going to be, you know, it's going to produce as, as well, be a producing director as well. So that meant a lot of commitment. So I said no a bunch of times, and then eventually it just became impossible to say no to because it just felt like it was too brave and too bold and too important, especially given everything that was happening in America at the time. And uh, so, yeah, that's how that I came to be involved with that. And and then the working relationship was just so kind of unique. Like I have so much um, freedom and uh, there is such a mutual kind of regard between myself and Damon and Court Jefferson, who wrote, um, you know, the black and white episode, which is the episode that everybody wants to talk about, about that thing. And um, so, yeah, it was really kind of, it was really satisfying. And it, there were a lot of things came converged, you know, what was happening in America at the time, the awareness of Tulsa, um, the tackling of the subject of erasure, uh, you know, and, um, as we say in Jamaica, the half of the story that has not yet been told. So trying to redress that imbalance is really important to me. Um, and it gave, um, gave me an opportunity to kind of be audacious creatively. So it, it satisfied all those, those criteria. I can't say it was fun to do because it was grueling and painful and emotionally draining, but it was important for me to to do you have won 
not only the Canadian awards that you have won and but numerous American uh, awards. And so that has put you in a different category. You are the director to be hunted down, to be found, to be added to a project. Um, you've nominated, I think you've won an Emmy <laughs> at least. I won, I won an Emmy for producing Watchmen. I, I only got nominated for directing. <laughs> only, yeah, <laughs> only got nominated <laughs> in a very small group of people that can even say that. But um, what do, what is the future for you? I know you're still focused on Watchmen, but what is it you're like, do you, do you think about five years, 10 years, even 15 years of where Steven wants to be, or that's just not something that you think about? <clears throat> I wish I did, um, but I don't. Uh, there are people that I admire who have these life plans, you know, um, I don't, I just want to keep, um, you know, I'm a broken record. I just want to keep growing, you know, um, and doing work that's important uh, to me and that I hope will connect with other people. And um, I do, I guess I would say that, you know, as time goes on, I want to work more intensively, but less. And I want to continue to be really protective over the time that I spend with my family. And uh, because I will say this, I mean, I'm going to sound like O Magazine right now, but I will say that at the end of my life, for sure, one thing, one of the things I know for sure is that I will not be lying on my deathbed saying, I don't know why I spent so much time with you guys, meaning my family. <laughs> when I, when I could have been doing an episode ever. of X, Y, or Z. That I know for sure I will not say. Uh, so I am really conscious of trying to shape my life in such a way that I work less, really intensively, but, um, you know, and balance that with, with, with spending um, as much time as I possibly can with my family. So that in a practical sense means movies, you know, um, and I just did this movie for Searchlight Productions. It's going to come out in the fall. I hope it's going to be at the Toronto Film Festival. It's called Chevalier and it's about a, uh, a black composer who was a contemporary of Mozart's um, in France in the mid 1700s. And he ultimately ended up becoming a really pivotal character in the French Revolution. Um, so we just did that movie. We shot that in the fall of last year in Europe. And uh, I'm editing it now and doing post-production and um, you know, hope to finish it this summer and in time for you know its launch in the fall. Um, and that's, I, so I kind of want to do more of, of that. I think that's that is where you're going to go because that does give you that time to go. I'm completely committed here now, and then I'm just going to have the time with my yeah, family. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Unrelated to even this now, I totally want to ask this question. Yeah. When was the first time you saw someone black on film or TV? How old were you? What was it? two images popped into my head. Actually, I'm going to scratch that and say three. I remember seeing Sidney Poitier in uh, To Sir With Love and In the Heat of the Night when I was a child. And Sidney Poitier has gone through a life cycle right in terms of the way in which he has been appraised by the culture at large and 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 black people but Sidney Poitier has always been a giant to me and I his grace and his ability to be self-determined regardless of the way in which the winds of fashion were blowing has always been clear to me. And I remember him with crystal clarity and I probably was, I don't want to date myself because, you know, we, this is Hollywood where age is not something we speak about and speak about just about anything else except age. But I was very, very young when I saw those movies. And then I remember seeing Diane Carroll in a TV series called Julia, which probably none of your viewers have ever heard of and they will have to Google. But Diane Carroll also had, it turns out, now that I'm thinking about it, had that same interior 
solidity, that same grace. And she was just a beautiful, beautiful black woman. Reminded me of my mother a lot, actually. And uh, so those are the first two. But then the third image that popped into my head was, uh, I hope I don't mispronounce her name, Nichelle Nicol Nichols from Star Trek. Yeah. Lieutenant Uhura. Yeah. I was a Star Trek. I was addicted to the first, you know, go round of Star Trek, William Shatner and her, and that she was in a position of power and that she was like, you know, she just had it all together. I remember being really impressed by her. And then later there was this actor called Tanya Williams who had the same surname as me, but was not related to me in any way, shape or form, but. Not that, not that we know of. <laughs> not that we know of, exactly, true enough, true enough. Not that we know of. But yeah, I just, I can't, uh, man, it's, I, I, when I think about you and my awareness of you, I, you, I put you in that same pantheon. I'm, I'm telling you, you have no idea. I'm telling you, every new arrival, it was kind of like, if there was an Ellis Island in Toronto, everybody would have been asked like, okay, uh, Toronto, is, is Tanya in your, in your pantheon? Because if she isn't, you can't have access. You can't come in, you can't take another step <laughs> forward. It was like, yeah. So you, um, you are a living example of pass it on, you know, you really are. And, um, you stand on shoulders and we stand on your shoulders. So can't well, thank you enough. Thank and that's you for real. That. I'm not just saying that. Thank you for that because it's almost embarrassing. I told someone I'm so used to people criticizing me. I really don't know what to do when people say nice things. <laughs> so it's like, so I do appreciate that and thank you. And for you to know that you are that pantheon now and the fact that you did this today, I know what your schedule is like and you took the time to do this. I, I can't tell you much. Not only I appreciate it, but all the people that are gonna be watching this and listening to this, your journey is truly it's a miraculous inspiration because i'm sure you go back to i was born in jamaica you know just when you look at the whole journey and where you've landed and and your position in hollywood right now that truly is just the dream you 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 are living it and uh thank you so much stephen um thank you and i hope there's been something of use uh to whoever uh, winds up watching this. Um, so I tell you something, I learned things. I learned things today that are going to be useful and helpful <laughs> in my own life. So so I really appreciate this and, and thank you so much. Thank you. Much appreciated. Be well. <laughs>